when I was young, it was ages ago. We were impressed by Jean-Paul Sartre, who told us that uh, we need to create Projet de la Vie, Project for Life. Now, tell that to the present-day youth, and they will laugh at you. We are uh, in great difficulty to uh, guess what will happen to us next year. Life is split into episodes, and once we selected the projects for life, we have to go step by step consistently from one year to another, closer and closer to this idea. Come, everyone ready? This is the first time in history where uh, the globe is really one country in a sense, that we are now interdependent, and therefore on the agenda stays problem, not of building of a nation state, not building of a local community of any sort, but of building a community of humanity. It's unavoidable. And I think that uh, people in 21st century will have to face this problem. <laughs> We have multiplied, we humanity on the planet, the connections, the relationships, the interdependencies, the communication spread all over the globe. We are now in a position that we are all dependent on each other. Community precedes you. You are born into a community. And if you want to leave it, go away and join another one, well, you can make it because we are living in democratic society, but it is not easy. You will be declared a traitor, you know, a turn coat, whatever, you don't observe tradition. Uh, how come, how, how dare you to do so, and so on. And enter a community is also a damn difficult thing, a real community, uh, because they, people will put you to the test, they will suspend, they suspect you of lack of sincerity, perhaps you have some evil uh, intentions about the community you enter, 20th century and before the 19th century was full of tragedies of people who wanted to join, not their community. Immigrants to uh, Germany, for example, Jews in Germany, right? Jews were dreaming about becoming Germans. Assimilation was the recipe for quite a lot of, of uh, tragedies. But um, today no longer is a problem. Because instead, we are not under control of communities, mostly.
one addict of uh, Facebook uh, confided in me, not confided, he actually boasted to me that he made 500 friends in one day. My reply was that I live 86 years, but I can't, I don't have 500 friends. You know, I, I didn't manage to do it. So presumably, when I, he says friend and I say friend, we don't mean the same thing. It's different kind of friend. Unlike community, network is made and maintained, uh, kept alive by two different activities. One is connecting and the other is disconnecting. The greatest attraction is the facility of disconnecting. I never heard when I was young the concept of network. I heard about uh, human bonds, I heard about communities, um, this sort of thing, but not network. Breaking relationship is always a very traumatic event. You have to find excuses, you have to explain, uh, you have to lie very often, and even then you, are, you don't feel safe because the partner would say, well, you have no right, you are swine, you are pig, you are whatever, over men, and so on. Uh, it's difficult, but on the internet it's so easy, you just press delete and that's it. Instead of uh, 500 friends, you have 499, but it is only a temporary irritant because tomorrow you have another 500. That undermines human bonds. So it's a very ambivalent situation. And hence, the curious phenomenon of this person, solitary person in a crowd of solitaries. Right? We are all in solitude and in a crowd at the same time. Very, very, very uh, confusing situation. If Aristotle was invited to the building of any of the contemporary parliaments, Aristotle, who first used the concept of democracy and described it, right, he would probably enjoy what he sees, because people quarrel, they represent different views, they argue, you know, they, then they vote, they come to some agreement. He would like it. But then if someone told him that that is democracy, he would laugh, because Democracy he described in ancient Athens was just people coming to the marketplace, you know, and, and fighting each other and then coming to some resolution. Which means that uh, democracy is a notion which acquires over time in history different forms and different instruments, different strategies. These institutions, which we now call democratic, were created were adjusted to the needs of a nation state. And needs of humanity will be different. The nearest approximation, contemporary approximation of Agora, of the place where democracy was made and remade and continued and developed and protected, the nearest approximation of it are chat shows on television. That's where uh, masses watch, participate, telephone, send questions, messages, Something similar to what was done in ancient Agora, when you look at it, they are not discussing our shared interests. They are not discussing the well-being of society. They are not discussing what needs to be done to uh, uh, abolish and uh, you know, repair the troubles which we all suffer in one actual and in another. They just confess their ultimately private individual and very intimate 
problems, right? So Agora has been conquered not by totalitarian regimes, but by precisely that, by privacy, by things which previously were privacy. In confessionals, which are the embodiment, the incarnation of intimacy and privacy, you converse there with God directly. And there is absolute secrecy. No one can know what you confess to in confessional. We have installed microphones in confessionals. And loudspeakers are in, connected to these microphones are installed on every public square. Open any glossy magazine, open any newspaper. What you see on the first floor? Who uh, betrayed, who was adulterous to whom, and uh, uh, who divorced of the celebrities, of course, and um, what are the latest gossips about the hidden girlfriends of the um, heir to the British throne, and things like that. That is allegedly public uh, agora, but it talks only about private affairs. Public issues disappear. If they appear because of some personal scandal, you hear about politicians only when they committed some corruption or you know some other fault, and then for two days you see their names on the first page, otherwise they disappear from there. That is, that is the danger. Autonomy of individual uh, does not support any longer autonomy of society as a totality. For a long, long time yet, it will be very difficult to decide what in 20th century was the most important, lasting, lasting durable uh, heritage for the coming generations. So many things happened in 20th century, and it's very early to decide which one of them will prove the most seminal, the most consequential. It was the times of extremities, like big totalitarian systems, too. Uh, different, yet uh, in very many respects similar to each other, Nazism, uh, communism. There was a lot of uh, ethnic hatred and uh, age of genocides, very widespread, not only uh, Holocaust. Uh, what happened in 20th century was passage from the whole era, from society of producers to society of consumers. On the other hand, you had the processes of fragmentation of human life. All the two things, I can say, they are really irreversible. One thing is that uh, we have multiplied the connections, the relationships, the interdependencies, the second issue is that after 300 years, roughly, of modern history, when our ancestors decided to uh, take over nature under human management, and uh, thus hoped that they will make uh, nature absolutely um, obedient to human needs, and uh, there will be full control over what's happening in the world. Now, that came to an end because in the result of our own successes and our ancestors' successes, development of modern technology, of uh, efficiency, of the ability to produce more and more and more, uh, rich for all sorts of uh, natural resources of the planet and so on, in the result of all this tremendous success of science and sociology, we came very closer, very close, to what we now understand are the limits of endurability of the planet. The two questions which I think are lasting, which I told you about, have one common denominator. When I was young, people didn't distinguish really uh, between two things, power and politics. Power is the ability to do things to do things. Politics is the ability to decide which things need to be done. And why we didn't distinguish in my youth uh, these two concepts? Very simply because uh, naturally they were married in a non-divorceable marriage. There was nothing 
no political institutions outside, beyond uh, nation state. What's happened again in 20th century is something absolutely unbelievable. They will divorce between the, in this marriage couple made in heaven, of which uh, when I was young I thought that it is uh, that no human interference can actually end it. But it didn't end. There's unlimited movement of capitals, of uh, investment funds, of uh, commodities, of information, of terrorism, of uh, uh, arms trade, uh, you know, of uh, all sorts of, of criminality and so on. They, the power, the ability to do things is already very often beyond the reach of the local politics. There is Brazilian politics, there is Ch Chilean politics, there is Argentinian politics, there is French politics. Sometimes there are some beginnings of European politics, but very little. Normally it is split into French, German, Italian and so on. But there is no global politics. What we call international politics is a misnomer. It's not even international, it is intergovernmental, interministerial but uh, really global, which is binding for the whole globe, does not exist. We didn't even start seriously doing it. Whatever else you youngsters will do, <laughs> of one sh thing I'm absolutely sure, that you have to face up to the problem of divorce between politics and power. And you have to ma force them, marry them again. Marry each other again. In Until we have politics and power at the same level, we will have a split like today between power which is uncontrolled by politics and politics which is powerless or at least suffers from the deficit of power. And I came to the conclusion that there are two essential values which are absolutely indispensable for a satisfactory, satisfying, rewarding, relatively happy life. One is security, the other is freedom. You can't be happy, you can't have a decent, dignified human life in the absence of one of them, right? Uh, Security without freedom is slavery. Freedom without security is complete chaos, inability to do anything, plan anything, even dream about anything. So you need both. The trouble, however, Professor Schiller, uh, again, that's my very firm conclusion, is that no one yet in history and in, on the planet found the golden formula, the perfect mixture of uh, security and freedom. Each time you get more security, you surrender a bit of your freedom. There's no other way. Each time you get a bit more freedom, you surrender part of your security. So you gain something and you lose something. The closer you, got, you come to the uh, pole uh, of security, the more you be develop nostalgia for the lost freedom. The closer you come to the pole of freedom, the more you develop nostalgia for the old good times when there were communities and everything was warm and steady and stable. And, um, and you knew on which to rely and what to do and so on. And there is no escape of that. Mm. So my conclusions are twofold. One, you will never find the perfect solution of the dilemma between security and freedom. There always will be too much of one and too little of the other, right? And the second, that we will never stop looking for such a golden mean. Mm -hmm. Faith is the short name for 
all things on which we have no influence, which happen to us, but they are not of our doing. That's right. And character is a very individual thing. You can work on your character if you want. You can change it, you can improve it. Uh, uh, it is under your control to a very great extent. The division of labor between fate and character is such that the fate sets the range of options which are realistic to you. On that you have no uh, influence. If you were born 20 years earlier than you were, your range of options will be different. If you uh, were born 20 years later, again it will be different. If you were born in this suburb, affluent suburb, you have one range of options. If you are uh, uh, born in a ghetto, it's completely different range of options. But there is always a range of options which is provided by fate. But the choices between these options are made by character. I know that there are counselors now who earn quite a lot of money by pretending that they have recipes for happiness. Don't believe them. They are, you know, uh, uh, hoodwink you. Uh, I would never dare to give such an advice because characters are very many and uh, very different. Uh, you can't give one recipe for happiness. Very many philosophers, uh, contemporary philosophers, consider uh, life of Socrates, the, his uh, personality, which he constructed, as the most perfect, relatively perfect, which you can imagine. But what does it mean? Does it mean that if Socrates' kind of life, which he selected, is the perfect, perfect solution for Socrates anyway. Does it mean that we all should imitate Socrates and try to be like him? No, the answer is on the contrary. Because precisely Socrates considered a secret of his happiness in that, that he on his own, by his own will, created the form of life which he lived. People who imitate somebody else's form of life, somebody else's model of happiness, are not like Socrates. On the contrary, they betray his recipe. Well, you can, you can translate it in a simple term saying that for every human being there is a perfect world made especially for him or for her. The only trouble is that most people look for this world in the wrong places. You have to spend your life, in fact, redefining your identity because the styles of life, the, the what is considered to be good for you and bad for you, uh, the attractive, tempting forms of life change so many times in your life. Mm -hmm.